Hi everyone, uh, today we're turning a corner. Uh, we are leaving the case of individual galaxies behind and we're going to go and study what galaxies look like en masse, so as a population as a whole. So we are going to take a start like this and uh, dive into the idea of galaxy populations. And to really get things started, I want to lay out some of the observational basics for this class uh, or for this subject. Uh, and the observational basics really started to come into four with the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, SDSS, or sometimes just called Sloan for short. Uh, this is a survey conducted in the early part of this millennium, and it was really the first truly large-scale digital survey of the sky. So digital here means that we're collecting data using CCD cameras and, as we'll see later, uh, digital fiber optic spectroscopy. And that allowed for the observation to be really quantified together into a single kind of unified data set. And the calibration of the Sloan Digital Sky Survey was better than, all, than anything that had come before. This was one of those uh, surveys that really nailed down some of the best properties of the local galactic population. And the thing that you see here is the SDSS camera uh, for the original survey. And you can see it sort of falls and has kind of different colors along it. And the way this camera worked is it kind of pointed up towards the sky and stayed fixed in place. And then it let the sky kind of track across it because of the Earth's rotation. It sort of spun underneath it. And they, uh, you might see that these have different colors. What would happen is the path of a star on the chip would kind of move under the Earth's rotation down through the different fil uh, to, through the different filters to the different cameras underneath, and they would be sort of uh, measured out in a way that tracked that star along and was able to measure it perfectly consistently of here's the star in one filter, here's the star in the next filter, here's the star in the next filter. And it was all done simultaneously, which gave us the really high quality images of uh, the entire sky. So um, this was kind of the landmark survey in its field. I'll remind you of something that we talked about uh, way back in uh, chapter one, which was the idea of the filter set. And I pointed out the Sloan filter sets, and here they become uh, quite important. So they are uh, UGRIZ, and we're going to focus mostly on G and R for green and red uh, in the blue green and then red part of the spectrum and we'll look at the g minus r color which is tracking basically the optical color of a bunch of galaxies now sloan was not just an imaging survey we'll come back to that later sloan also was a um a spectroscopy survey so in addition to having the great digital uh, camera plates uh, a subsequent observation did a bunch of spectroscopy of the objects that they found and they would see a bunch of spectra like this. So now at this point in the class, we can look at this and really interpret what's going on. So this is all of the light from the central part of a galaxy and is fed into one place uh, in the telescope and uh, it gets read out as a single spectrum. And so it's the optical section of the spectrum. Here's the flux density in watts per meter squared per nanometer. And uh, what you're seeing here is a bunch of uh, spectral features. The emission lines are from the interstellar medium. These are typically from the H2 regions. They are also sometimes from the uh, AGN in the centers of the galaxies. And then uh, the absorb, the continuum underneath, you notice this isn't at zero, but is actually measuring the stellar continuum uh, along here, you can see absorption lines from the underlying stars. So those are the stellar photospheres of the uh, individual stars. And so these are a bunch of lines in the atmospheres of stars that gives us the absorption lines. The basic is the starlight. And then these very narrow spectral features are the interstellar medium. So the other thing you might note about this is that uh, the Spectral lines aren't where they should be. Uh, if you look at this line, uh, there should be a line uh, for H alpha here at 656 nanometers. 
but we don't see that. We see that line here at about 680 nanometers. And so it has been shifted. It has been shifted redward. So we think that this is, uh, looks like a galaxy that is receding from us uh, uh, and has a large positive radial velocity. But this effect is actually from the cosmological redshift, and it manifests as a recession velocity, uh, but it is actually something that is related to, but not exactly the same as that. And so this uh, redshift is from the expanding universe. And we're going to quantify the redshift and then we'll explain it. And we define redshift in our um, uh, field here as the ratio of the observed wavelength relative to the rest wavelength. So the observed over the rest is defined as one plus Z. So for this system, I can ask you the question, well, what is the redshift of this galaxy if we observe it at uh, 683 nanometers. So, uh, there we are. Uh, if we say that one, uh, we'll get this here, one plus Z is equal to 683 nanometers divided by 656 nanometers, that gives me a value of 1.044, and that implies that Z is equal to 0 0.04. Four, four. And so it's a dimensionless number, and it represents uh, something to do with the shift of the wavelength. Well, we can then ask the question, where does that shift come from? And then how can I turn it into a velocity? Now we can do a little bit of bonus math on top of this, just to kind of uh, hit home the points. The um, uh, I want you to notice that if we use the Doppler formula, that would be delta lambda over lambda is equal to uh, V over C, where VR is the radial velocity. And so that's lambda obs minus lambda rest over lambda rest is equal to V over C. And lambda obs over lambda rest, that's one plus Z. So this is lambda obs over lambda rest is equal uh, minus one uh, is equal to v over c let's come on up here lambda observer and lambda rest is one plus z minus one is equal to v over c uh, we'll cancel that and so then we get that cz is equal to v and so this gives us a little expression if we see a redshift z multiply by the speed of light and that'll give us the uh non-relativistic doppler shift for that target Okay, uh, so I want to return uh, here, oops, to here, uh, which shows you a model of the universe. Um, it's gorgeous, I made it for you myself. And our model for the universe, I've used a bunch of stars to represent galaxies. And I want to discuss the cosmological redshift in the context of this model for the universe. Uh, so each of these stars is supposed to represent a galaxy. They are not gravitating towards each other. Uh, they are a uniform field, universe at very large scales. I want to imagine what will happen if this universe expands. So it gets larger for some unknown reason that you can study in Astro 430, uh, but it gets larger uh, and expands. And so our uh, stars here, or sorry, our galaxies go from here to something that looks like this. This is a smaller universe. This is a larger universe. All I've done is I've expanded the scale of everything in the universe uh, or all the space in between everything in the universe. The actual sizes of the objects themselves, if they are self-gravitating, they do not undergo this expansion. So that's an important thing is that gravity holds back against the cosmological expansion. Uh, so, you know, we grow this here. What I'm going to do is I'm going to line up the expanded universe with the uh, original universe for a star like this. And so we'll do that. We'll line those uh, two things up here. Because of gravity, if you were in this galaxy, you would not see anything uh, around you expand in the galaxy, but you would see all the rest of the universe uh, expand. And so what you see is that everything uh, kind of looks like it gets farther away from you as you go from the 
uh, first state, which is the solid outline stars, to the second state, the expanded state, is the dotted outline. And you can see it gets, uh, as we go farther and farther away, uh, the uh, difference between the initial and the final positions actually gets larger. So if this happens over a period of time, we would see first, everything in the universe appears to be receding away from us there in that system. And the farther away something is, the faster it's moving away from us. So uh, those are the two main effects that we can see here. But I want you to notice that it looks like we're at the center of the expansion. But I can pick a different target over here, that galaxy, and say, well, what happens if we were in that galaxy? Uh, where would the center of the expansion be? And if I reline up there, I see the same basic effects. Everything in the universe is moving away from us in all directions, and the farther away an object is, the faster it appears to be moving. Uh, so this is how we interpret the cosmological redshift. It is the byproduct of essentially the light traveling from us to, uh, or from a distant system to us, through the course of this universal expansion, and that will stretch out the wavelength of light there. So the, um, uh, and we can use this to actually figure out uh, the distances to objects if the rate of the universe's expansion is well understood in the current day. And so this gives rise to the Hubble law, which states that the apparent recession velocity of the system is correlated with the distance, and that's representing this effect. The farther away this object is, the faster it appears to be moving. And this is really just the redshift that we are interpreting as a velocity, even though it's not actually a uh, velocity because it is not emitted with that wavelength from here. It gets stretched out as it goes. So um, the apparent recession velocity uh, being correlated with the distance means that we can just measure the expansion of the universe and then the apparent velocities, which are just CZ, the, the speed of light times the redshift, and uh, if we knew this constant, we can figure out how far away things are. And so by making a bunch of independent measurements of the distances to objects and then using the uh, observed spectroscopic redshifts for those systems, then we have inferred that the rate of expansion of the universe is given by this constant. Since this is something that was discovered by the astronomer Hubble, it is called Hubble's Law. And the constant in Hubble's Law for our universe right now is 70.4 plus 1.4 kilometers per second per megaparsec. So that means if I observe something moving away from me in, uh, or something that is, um, you know, one megaparsec away, or let's say 10 megaparsecs away, it would appear to be receding from me at 10 times this number, so 704 kilometers per second in sort of CZ units. Now, we don't interpret this as necessarily the velocity, even though if you sort of consider this the distance between these two objects and then divided by the time it took to expand it, it would give you a velocity. I mentioned earlier that we do not consider it a true Doppler shift because it's not emitted from the moving object at a given speed, but rather as the universe goes, the wavelength of the light gets pulled apart because the wavelength is connected to uh, space, uh, uh, the space is propagating in, and as the space slowly stretches, the wavelength of the light gets longer and it gets redder. So if we interpret the separation uh, between galaxies as driving this cosmological redshift and the change in separation is leading to this cosmological redshift, we can say that if we look and see redshifted light from the universe uh, from uh, from the universe a while ago, and we're looking at a distant object, we can say that that object was closer to us by a factor of one over one plus the redshift. Essentially, the scale of light now, or the scale of light then, relative to the scale of light that we see now. 
and that traces the size of the universe then versus now. And so this leads us to a relationship that if we see an object at redshift of a given value z, then the separation between objects that are emitting and receiving that light in the past relative to now is just one over one plus z. So essentially this is tracing the evolution of the scale factor of the universe and we can compare and see that these objects are moving farther apart through the cosmological, uh, cosmological expansion. And if we look at a given redshift, then we can figure out how far uh, away those objects were in the past. Now, I should uh, stress at this point that, uh, again, these objects cannot be gravitationally bound to each other. Once things are gravitationally bound, they no longer participate in this Hubble flow, this cosmological expansion. <clears throat> now, I will finally note that we can also relate the evolution of the uh, redshift uh, to how far back in time we are looking. This is not from this class. This is what you learn in Astro 430. You can start out with Einstein's field equations and come up with what the universe is actually doing uh, over the course of its evolution, plug in the measured values, and you can develop this relationship that basically asks, how far in the past am I looking if I look at a given redshift? And this is important because uh, this is tracking essentially how the universe is expanding is changing over the time, whether it's accelerating or decelerating or cruising along as a constant, this uh, curve is a function of that evolution. And again, Astro 430, wonderful class, uh, but it will give you the pieces that you need uh, to figure this out. But this is what's called the look back time, which is basically saying it taking into account the light travel time from an object to now and basically asking how far in the past is that object? If I observe the redshift, I see the spectral lines where I see them, how far in the past am I observing? So this is a combination of the Hubble flow, Hubble flow and how the universe is expanding. And so if we look, we can see we will often study uh, objects at redshift five. Uh, and we'll see that that's looking almost 12 and a half billion years in the past. 14 on this scale, which is up here slightly across the top, that's about the known age of the universe. And we can see we sort of asymptotically approach it. So that if we look at, say, the Redshift 10 sources that we're looking at um, in the James Webb Space Telescope data, uh, things beyond this Redshift 10, those are looking back in the past 12 and a half to almost 13 billion years ago. Difference that from uh, 14, which is the age of the universe, and you find this is sort of the first, we're reaching here, the first billion years of the age of the universe. So now let's just keep this curve in mind, and then you can derive it. Uh, as you see fit in Astro 430. Okay, so um, we can take all of this as preface to what Sloan actually saw about the galaxy uh, population by studying a bunch of different objects in different filters and then using the Hubble flow to actually figure out how far away they were and from that information correct that and figure out the absolute or volume, uh, the absolute magnitudes of those systems, use inverse square law, figure out their luminosities, etc. So uh, what they found was this diagram. This is the galaxy color magnitude diagram. We are used to looking at the stellar color magnitude diagram. This is the same thing. And for reasons that are utterly infuriating, we transpose the diagram. Not we. It's not my fault, I swear. On the horizontal axis, we are plotting the absolute magnitude of the system in G, that's in the G band. On the vertical axis, that's the G minus R color. And uh, you'll notice that the absolute magnitude is uh, uh, going and becoming more negative as we head off to the right. So the axis is, again, backwards, but this leads to the sense that since they're negative numbers, uh, and the larger negative numbers are brighter objects in the magnitude system, that means stuff over here is bright, or high luminosity, and stuff over here is faint and low luminosity. Similarly, the stuff on the uh, bottom 
axis here. That's blue because uh, it's a G minus R color that is closer to the negative side. And then uh, the stuff up top is red, which is because uh, we have a G minus R color that is becoming positive. Uh, I have color coded the points of the individual data to make that a little easier to see. Uh, they don't come this way. I just made this plot. And then uh, the brighter stuff is over here. So uh, we immediately see, just like in the uh, HR diagram, we see groups of objects in this parameter space. And much like the HR diagram, the groups of objects are sharing similar evolutionary paths. So uh, what we see are a bunch of relatively luminous red galaxies, uh, which we call the red sequence, because there's a bit of a correlation to this, uh, where the brighter it is, the redder it is. Uh, there we also have a blue cloud, so these are blue galaxies, and these are uh, was distributed in sort of a you know, smear, so we call this a cloud. And then in between red and blue, there's a deficit or a dearth of galaxies. And these are often called the green valley because the colors are green, not because it's uh, delightful in any other way. Anyways, um, what we know from our study of stellar populations, see, it all comes back, is that the systems that are in the blue portion of this color diagram have had recent star formation. Whereas red galaxies have the default color of galaxies, they're dominated by the red giants and the main sequence uh, stars in this system. Uh, they don't have recent star formation, therefore they do not have any high mass stars, they've all evolved away. You're left with red colors, and that means that we have non-star forming galaxies. So it's kind of neat. You see there's two populations of galaxies, a red cloud, or a red sequence, and a blue cloud, and then in between, something in between. There aren't very, it's not a continuum. There is definitely a gap between these two populations. So what happens? Why is there a gap? Why are there, why are some galaxies red and some galaxies blue? Uh, I'll point out and just remind you what this actually means. This is a plot of our favorite uh, interacting system. This is the Whirlpool Galaxy M51. This is its perturber, which I think is M51b. Uh, and it's going by, uh, wheel, uh, whipping by it. And it, uh, this one here is a nice red uh, cloud uh, or red sequence galaxy. And then this, uh, the big bright star former one is in the uh, blue cloud here. And uh, our Milky Way is slightly uh, less bright uh, but a little bit greener. So it's actually a rarity. It's in uh, the Milky Way appears to be kind of heading into this green valley. It's on the slope going into the green valley. All right. Let's show you what these actually look like. These are all images that are taken from the NGC imaging page of uh, David Hogg at NYU. And uh, this uh, particular, uh, what we're just seeing are the different types of galaxies. So this is what a red sequence galaxy looks like. Looks uh, pretty boring, pretty elliptical. Here's a, another red sequence galaxy. Again, oh, maybe a little cigar shaped or a little uh, sort of extended here. Uh, 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 in, in one direction versus another. Uh, but again, very red in color, uh, colored here in whatever that is, yellowish, whatever. Yeah. Uh, this, in contrast, is what a blue cloud looks like. I believe it. This is blue. So we see a nice uh, star-forming uh, system, lots of little clumps, spiral arms, disk galaxy all the way. Maybe the beginning of a bit of a bar here in the middle. But yeah, blue cloud galaxy. Here's another blue cloud galaxy. Uh, this one maybe is a little bit edge on, uh, got some uh, neighbors around it. Uh, but yeah, it looks like a uh, actively star forming galaxy. You see those bright blue stars. Uh, this legitimately looks like a blue cloud. It's an irregular system. It doesn't have a lot going on, but boy, is it blue. Lots of active star formation. And then you can look at stuff in the Green Valley. So this is a system that it was a disk galaxy, but you can see it has a color that's not quite as blue as one of those blue cloud galaxies. It's uh, definitely here, and you know we see a little bit more of the sort of redder colors popping up in the center. 
Uh, here's another one. Big bar in the center. We know that bars suppress star formation because they have those long orbits that kind of shear apart gas and stop clouds from forming into stars. For, excuse me, forming stars there. And then we have a disk of uh, blue uh, ongoing star formation around it, but not very bright. And, oh, here's another one, a very similar pattern. We've got a bar, we've got a ring around it, we've got some beautiful spiral arms. I love this particular galaxy um, for other reasons, but uh, yeah, it's a, it is exactly the kind of system uh, that you would think of as a green belly. It's got part of its red and part of its blue. Uh, so green belly. So these are all different sides. And this is giving us a clue that the shapes of galaxies are actually related to their colors. And we can actually study this using the Sloan Digital Sky Survey data. And you may recall uh, that there's this thing that we call the Sursich Index, which is essentially how much light is concentrated into the center. A n equals 1 Sursich Index follows a nice exponential disk. Notice this is a log scale on the y-axis and a horizontal scale on the x-axis. And we get a nice exponential disk that has an index of one. And then an n equals four index has this very bright central peak. And uh, we said earlier that we associate disks with this n equals one, and then ellipticals and spheroidals have an index that are increases, so uh, the four here. So what we can do is we can make a plot of the uh, main sequence, and we can't, uh, but Blinton and Moustakas can, and uh, in their beautiful image here, uh, what they are showing is the galaxy main sequence. Uh, that, this is the same diagram that I had made for you. Red sequence, uh, blue cloud, so uh, green valley right here. So this is a plot of absolute magnitude across the top, uh, so these are uh, low luminosity versus high luminosity, blue systems, red systems. And then the thing that they append onto this information is the Sursich index. And so here, that's shown on this axis. These are all plots that share the same um, uh, axes. And the contours here indicate the density of points. So higher, grayer points, that just means more galaxies with that property. And we see that the uh, disk-like systems have an index of one. They're down here, and they're associated with this blue cloud. Okay, that's consistent with the images we just saw. And then the red sequence stuff, that's all sort of smeared out up here. Uh, those have indices that are like two and a half to five or something wild like that. And we can see this again here in terms of the colors, all the blue stuff like down here, that has a specific disc-like structure. And then everything in the green valley and the red sort of transitions to being elliptical, spheroidal, looks like a galaxy bulge, maybe has a bar in it here. And there's a wide range of search indexes for the um, red sequence here. So that's kind of a neat thing. So we see red red sequence uh, systems are elliptical-like. Blue cloud galaxies are usually disk-like. Okay, next point about this that I want to raise is that we've been plotting absolute magnitude here, which corresponds to the luminosity, and this specifically corresponds to the luminosity in the R-band. Earlier I had shown you the G-band, uh, but both of those have very different light to mass ratios as a pop, uh, the stellar population ages. Uh, so you may recall this figure from chapter four, which shows the light to mass ratio, which is essentially if I see this much light in the system, I can figure out how much mass there is in the system. And uh, I've indicated the Sloan bands across here. And what you can see, we focused last time on the relative colors here. The young line that's up here has more in the G band relative to the R band. And so that means it's a bluer system. And then the old systems have sort of a flat trend across here. So they have a redder color relative to the blue. What we didn't focus on, but becomes important now, is the absolute scale here. I haven't shifted these curves at all. And if you compare the 10 giga year to the 100 mega year, this is time since active star formation, 
there is a factor of two or sorry two uh, uh, orders of magnitude or about a factor of 100 between them so that if we look at an old system and we look at a young system and they have the same luminosity in the G or the R band, the luminosity of the old system is a hundred times larger than the, uh, sorry, the mass of the 10 giga year old system is a hundred times larger than the mass of the younger system. So this is important is that even if they look like they have about the same luminosities or the same absolute magnitudes, if it's red, there's a lot more mass hanging out there. Uh, the blue systems are dominated by the few stars emitting a lot of light. And so uh, this light to mass ratio becomes quite important. And what that means is if I look at a uh, color magnitude diagram like this, you might think, okay, blue cloud galaxies and red sequence galaxies, well, they have about the same luminosity, so they must be kind of comparable in mass. And we're like, no, 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 no. If a system is red, its mass is a substantial fraction larger, an order of magnitude, sometimes two at times, depending on the star formation histories of these two populations. So let's bear that in mind as we go forward, uh, and we can actually do this conversion and represent the galaxies in the individual uh, sort of physical bolometric qualities of a galaxy. And if we do that, we get a plot that looks like this. So what I've done is I've turned the, uh, not I, uh, colleague of mine has turned the information that is seen from the spectral energy distribution of the galaxy into physical properties. Uh, so mapping that into the mass of the uh, object and uh, the other property that's plotted here is the star formation rate. So this is related to the color and then the mass of the object is related to the color and the luminosity that we derive. And so what we see here is we have a star formation rate versus a mass and again we see the two populations of galaxies, but instead of uh, uh, but instead of the red sequence being on top, here the diagram is sort of flipped back the other way. These clouds down here, or these uh, data down here, those are what we were calling the red sequence earlier. And then we have the blue cloud uh, are these galaxies up here. But when we plot it in this space, we give those different names. Once they're in the physical unit, you'll notice this appears to be elongated along a line. And then there's a bunch of stuff down here that is more massive, but not actively star forming. Oh, okay, that makes sense because the, you said like the elliptical systems don't have active star formation. And you see, that's down here. Not much star formation. Okay. So given that, uh, we can dissect and label this a little bit more. Uh, we draw a line that runs through the kind of major axis of this density distribution and say that most stars fall along this line. And we call that the star forming main sequence of galaxies. And so the main sequence is meant to invoke the idea of main sequence in stars, which is most of the stars seem to spend a lot of their star formation lives there on this axis. And because they are star forming, they are building up their stellar mass. So an object that is down here at a billion solar masses will undergo star formation and it will start to rise up. And you can see that something down here is going to have a star formation rate of a tenth of a solar mass per year. And so over a billion years, this object will sort of move up uh, to uh, a little farther up here. So that'll give us a nice uh, increase in stellar mass to 1.1 billion uh, solar masses. Okay, and so it creeps its way on up here. And we see in this uh, system that there's this relationship that the star formation rate is related to the overall mass of a galaxy to the 0.68 power. Uh, so you can see 10, 0.68, so a 
10, solar ma uh, 10 to the 10 solar mass galaxy, kind of like our Milky Way, should have a star formation rate that's a little larger than uh, 0.67. Uh, Milky Way is about 2 times 10 to the 10 in solar mass, so it should be a little bit larger. And indeed, we see that it is uh, a star forming, but maybe a little low for its mass. It ends up sort of down slightly below the star forming main sequence. We also often describe this in terms of the specific star formation rate, uh, which is the current star formation rate divided by the current stellar mass. And this will give you an inverse time. And I think about that time scale as the time it would take to build up a galaxy's mass at the current star formation rate. But on average, we see that these ages are typically uh, long. In fact, for quenched systems, you can look at this and you can see, okay, this system here has a mass of 3 times 10 to the 10 solar masses, and it has a star formation rate of a tenth of a solar mass per year. And so that would mean it would take 300 billion years to build up its current mass at the observed star formation rate. The universe is only 14 billion years old, so that must mean that it had a higher star formation rate in the past and is now star forming less actively than it used to in the glory days of its youth. So we have the star forming main sequence and all of these systems down here that were forming stars much more actively in their past and have stopped, we call these quenched systems. So something has come in and quenched the star formation in these. They have stopped being active star formers. They have fallen off the main sequence. And we think that this is the evolutionary trend, is that things move up the main sequence to some maximum values uh, and then transition into quenched galactic systems. But what? Well, we don't know. It's an active line of research. You can figure it out uh, by applying for a bunch of... Um, uh, you can for, apply for a bunch of funding, and then you can uh, go and pursue some of these hypotheses. I'll just list off a few of them here uh, that people are testing. Um, for example, uh, we know that the star formation in a galaxy is fueled by accretion of material from the cosmic web around it. Uh, and so what if you have a massive system and it basically ate all the gas around it already? Well, uh, that that would lead to quenching. You would have no incoming fuel. What about if the gas is there, but it doesn't cool down to the star forming form? Uh, well, uh, this can happen if the gas is way too hot and then it's cooling times, a la the interstellar medium uh, chapter, are way too long. Uh, well, what happens if uh, there is cold gas there, but something about the galaxy destabilizes it and prevents it from um, ever forming stars? Uh, an example, this is a bar. It shears out the gas. So that could be some reason that we aren't seeing any star formation. Uh, this kind of thing is called morphological quenching, where you don't have the standard sort of disk structure that compresses down the interstellar medium, gets nice cold cold clouds, uh, and if it's a bulge and the ISM is spread apart, well, this could be a reason why you don't see that. Remember all those bars we saw in the green belly galaxies? They might be quenching. Uh, the cold gas could have been consumed already, uh, so this happens if there's starbursts or collisions. More on that a little bit later. And then the gas could just be removed, so AGN could be responsible for quenching and driving away all of the gas. Oh. So um, the that gives us kind of a dis uh, distinction between the star formation main sequence and uh, quenched galaxies. Well, uh, the next thing that we can characterize in the galaxy population is its luminosity function. Uh, so much like we had an initial mass function uh, for stars, as well as the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram, uh, the luminosity function is tabulating all of the galaxies that are found in a given range of luminosities. We don't normally turn this directly into mass quite yet. Uh, so the observed quantity is how bright all of these galaxies are. And uh, we generally, because we're looking over a volume of uh, space and counting a bunch of galaxies in it, we normalize this by the survey volume. So nor we write this 
as uh, the number of galaxies that are found in a range of luminosities between L and DL, well, that's uh, B, uh, DN, that's here. And we're gonna normalize it by the width of that bin, so DN by DL. And then we're going to divide it by the survey volume. So this is basically a differential number density at a given luminosity uh, per unit luminosity. So this is a density function, much like density, like the IMF, all of those things should activate, except instead of using mass, like we did for the IMF, we have luminosity, which is uh, appropriate for uh, treating the luminosities of galaxies. And this is the luminosity function uh, for a bunch of galaxies. So it's plotted here. Uh, this is luminosity in solar units uh, divided by, and then this is dn by dl, and I've scaled it to arbitrary units because I could not find the effective survey volume for the data that I used. Uh, so uh, what we have is this little step function. This is the number of galaxies in a given luminosity bin, and then over top of it, we plot a very commonly fit functional form called the Schechter function, but notice it falls off pretty quickly and then it hits a point where it really just tanks and then there are just not many galaxies that are more luminous than about 10 to the 11 solar luminosities in the universe around us. So this is the form of the Schechter function. For the IMF, you used a uh, power law form. Uh, this also has a power law. Uh, has some constants in front of it, which we typically write as phi over L uh, star. Uh, L star is the characteristic luminosity of the system. This was, we use the solar mass in the case of the INF. Uh, but here, this is the characteristic luminosity. And then there's this extra term. This is an exponential cutoff. So we have a power law term coming down here. And then we have an exponential cutoff, which really sharply pulls this over. So this power law is typically minus uh, 0.8, minus 0.9. I think this is plotted from minus 1.5, uh, which is a relatively steep relationship. And then L star is the one parameter I want to really pay attention to because it's essentially this knee in this distribution. And that knee is a characteristic scale. This is kind of the maximum luminosity scale that galaxies reach in our universe. And it's about a Milky Way uh, luminosity. Two times 10 to the 10th, we call it L star. So things that are up and around that, we call these are L star galaxies, which just means about as bright as galaxies get. Yes, there are brighter galaxies up here at 10 to the 11, but they're very rare. And we represent that functionally in terms of this exponential cutoff. If we look at the past using high redshift studies of the uh, uh, luminosity function uh, for galaxies, we find that L star was smaller in the past. And so it is increasing uh, over time. But once a galaxy builds up and gets enough mass and enough luminosity to sort of reach this L star threshold, something quenches it. And we sort of see it sort of turn over at that point. Um, so it's telling us how the universe is behaving and developing galaxies within it. And it also tells us a bit about uh, something about the quenching process. All right. Um, that kind of covers the galaxy population and the things that we need to understand as we go forward. Uh, these are kind of the observations. We have a bunch of questions as to why, and we'll cover and sort of tie up this in the context of everything we've learned in the last chapter. Uh, but the last thing that's really important for understanding the galaxy population is the idea of groups and clusters of galaxies. Now, galaxies are gregarious sorts, which means they like to hang out with each other. And by like to hang out with each other, it might just mean mutually attracted to each other based on self uh, mutual gravitational interaction. You know, kind of like everything in the universe uh, wants to kind of get gravitationally attracted together. But in the case of galaxies, they're all just kind of falling down towards each other. So you tend to see that there are large chunks of space with almost no galaxies in them. And then you see large, uh, small regions where the galaxies are concentrated. They're organized into groups and clusters. And the only distinction between a group and a cluster is the number of galaxies within it. Uh, so just typically the boundary is about 50 galaxies. Uh, and if you have 50 galaxies, you're a group. Otherwise, you're a cluster. No physical definition, just gives us a sense of scale. 
Galaxy clusters, the big ones, are the largest gravitationally bound structures in the universe. So these are what we call the things in the universe. These are the biggest things in the universe. They have something like, I think this is a quadrillion solar masses, uh, 10 to the 15, like in, you know, uh, actually useful units. And uh, this has also grown over time. If we look back, the galaxy clusters were less massive in the past. Uh, we actually live in a group for reasons that we are, can be relatively grateful for. We call this the local group because it's, wait for it, local. Here's a nice little three-dimensional map that I uh, found on Wikipedia by Andrew Colvin. Uh, and it sort of illustrates the sort of three-dimensional structure of the local group. Not, you know, it's a sort of perspective drawing of uh, the systems in the local group. And you see that there's basically two big systems here. There's Andromeda and the Milky Way. And around each of these systems, there's a bunch of tiny little dwarf galaxies. So these are small, typically blue cloud galaxies with masses of 10 to the 9 and below. The most prominent uh, galaxy in our local collection is the Large Magellanic Cloud. And if you visit the Southern Hemisphere during the right time of year, you can just see this. It's uh, our neighboring next door galaxy. Uh, and uh, if you think that, oh, the, uh, we're about, you know, eight, let's call it 10 kiloparsecs from the center of our galaxy, uh, the Large Magellanic Cloud is only about 50 kiloparsecs away. So we are, uh, the, the, the distance between us and the center of the galaxy is only a fifth the distance between us and the nearest large galaxy. And there are even closer galaxies to uh, the Milky Way. Uh, there's one that's uh, called the Sagittarius Dwarf. Uh, it's on the other side of the center of the galaxy, kind of coming in and getting ready to crash into the galactic disk. Uh, Small Magellanic Cloud and a bunch of other tiny little, uh, you know, uh, Canis Venatici A1. Uh, you know, it just trips off the name, uh, the tongue, all these little dwarf galaxies. Oh, and over here, Andromeda has a collection of them too, called Andromeda 1, Andromeda 2, etc., etc. Uh, and then there's all these additional uh, small galaxies. My favorite galaxy here is the Triangulum Galaxy. That's M33. Uh, it's a local group galaxy. We have uh, the ever popular IC 1613 and so on. Uh, they all fill out this local group of galaxies. And uh, my orientation to the geography should just sensitize you to the fact that there are these massive galaxies with clusters of smaller galaxies around them or groupings of smaller galaxies around them because gravity is pulling them all together. Uh, now, this is the local group of galaxies and it is situated in a larger macro structure. Uh, these are the local clusters of galaxies. Our local group is in here, kind of illustrated here in blue, and we are near uh, a few other groups, the M101, M81 group, etc. Uh, and then we see uh, the clusters. We have large clusters like the Virgo cluster, the Centaurus cluster, Hydra cluster, Eridanus cluster, uh, and these all are uh, much larger groups of galaxies, hundreds or thousands of galaxies here uh, all around us. And we're in a relatively sparse neighborhood, um, still pretty busy on the galactic scale, uh, but still uh, we have these groups of galaxies. And if you squint, you can sort of see, do these seem to be sitting on a line? Is there a line here? And a line here. Well, kind of, sort of, yeah. And we'll come back to that next time because it's an interesting question as to why we're sitting in lines uh, of material. But anyways, um, I can show you what a galaxy cluster looks like up close. Uh, these are big groups uh, here. Uh, this is a massive elliptical galaxy. Indeed, most of the big clusters have a giant elliptical sitting in their center. It's the brightest cluster galaxy. Uh, it tends to be huge, like anomalously huge, bigger than the luminosity function may imply. And then you see all these other little galaxies around it. Uh, galaxy, 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 just 
hundreds in snacks. Uh, this is a JWST t image um, provided by Space Telescope. And uh, so we see that. The other thing you might see is these tiny little arcs. Arc, 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 arc. All of those, ooh, even this sort of looks like a pizza being thrown in the air or something. All those little arcs and this tossed pizza, those are background galaxies. And this entire system here is acting like a giant lens. It's a gravitational lens so that light is coming from these background galaxies and gets focused by this elliptical and all its neighbors uh, in this cluster in towards uh, the Milky Way. And so these are, we see the light as if this central galaxy is acting like a giant magnifying glass to see the stuff behind it. So it's really pretty amazing. A um, couple other comments about uh, galaxy groups and clusters. Uh, I kind of alluded to it earlier with my comment about how close the Large Magellanic Cloud was. Um, if you think about stars, uh, and you kind of compare the separations between stars to how big a star is, uh, why, that's huge. It's uh, something like a factor of 40 million, uh, the separation between stars, which is about a parsec, relative to the size of stars, which is about a solar radius. Yeah, it's about 40 million. Uh, in contrast, the separation between galaxies, especially in clusters and groups, is not as large. Uh, say they're about a megaparsec across uh, or megaparsec apart and about 10 par kiloparsecs across. That's only a factor of 100. And so it's actually relatively easy for galaxies to move through clusters and come within uh, sort of their size. So they actually physically touch and splat off each other and collide. And so these galaxy collisions uh, are an important part of astrophysics, but they're still pretty long. If you actually work this out using the dynamics math that we did earlier, you find that uh, galaxy collisions still take about 30 times the Hubble time. It's not like hundreds of thousands of times the way it was for stars, but uh, it's still pretty long and we need something to accelerate it given uh, the stars, or given what we see, uh, that we see plenty of collisions, so something's going to make these more frequent. And the answer to that is a process that we call dynamical friction. So let's take a time to understand what's happening in the case of dynamical friction. So the physical setup that we're going to consider here is a big object, let's call it big M moving at speed V through a field of tiny objects that will have each a little M. And so big M object moving through a field of little objects of mass, tiny M. And so as it's proceeding through this, uh, what's happening is each of these objects is pulling a little bit on uh, uh, the big mass as it moves forward. And so we're going to see that the uh, little objects are going to decelerate it. Uh, the physical cartoon of what happens is that this kind of create, we think about this in terms of a wake. So as this... Um, uh, like a boat wake, you know, what sort of goes behind it. As this object M goes through, each of these little objects is going to be accelerated towards the mass as it passes. So they're all going to kind of pull down on it. And what happens is you end up concentrating some masses behind the big object. And this concentration here is going to end up giving a little bit of a back reaction and it's going to pull back on it. So that's kind of the cartoon of what we think about, but we actually treat this through the set ideas of impulse and momentum and energy. So uh, what we've done here is we set up a scenario where we see something that looks an awful lot like a collision problem, where we think about uh, a given particle uh, and we're going to say uh, this one, let's, let's draw a new particle, fresh for this derivation. And it's going to be located a distance b away from the trajectory of the massive uh, 
object, or the mass of objects as it goes through. So B is the impact parameter here. And from chapter four, we know that the change in momentum for this little object M here, also little object M, uh, is going to be have the magnitude 2GM M over BV, where big M is uh, the mass of the uh, moving object, and uh, little m is the mass of the uh, tiny object. I think in your, I just copy pasted this from chapter four, uh, but in your text, I think I'm using big V for the uh, speed with which it's moving forth. And so what I'd like to know is what is the change in kinetic energy uh, from motion in the perpendicular direction. So there's no directionality to energy, but we say, well, how much energy do these things, these little objects get given as this big object goes by? Well, uh, we know from this that the uh, that, that is just going to be given by uh, the, oh, sorry, uh, yeah, the, that is just going to be given by well, however fast the big object is moving and however fast the little object is moving from a singular uh, encounter. So that's going to be one half m times essentially a little bit of a uh, v big, uh, let's call it uh, v perp uh, plus one half little m little v perp. I'm going to give this one some upstairs feet so it's uh, kind of strong. Uh, or be distinguishable. But we know that uh, the big V perp is going to be uh, the same momentum is going to happen because it's uh, equal and opposite forces. Same momentum change will happen. And so this is just going to be uh, del uh, to delta P over the big M, which is 2G little m over BV. And similarly, little v perp is going to be the same momentum, delta P perp over little m, which is going to leave 2G big m over BV. And I'm going to plug these into my change in kinetic energy uh, moving in the perpendicular direction, from perpendicular direction motion. So that's 1 half big m times 4G squared little m squared over b squared big v squared plus same term over here little m times 4 g squared big m squared all over b squared v squared okay uh from here i can pull out the prefactor just to make things a little nicer 2 g m squared uh, oh sorry 2 g don't let's let's not mess with the m's quite yet uh 2 g squared that's where we were going 2 g squared over b squared of v squared and that leaves us with a big m little m squared plus a uh, little m big m squared so i'll just write this a little more neatly 2g squared uh sorry compactly because the heavens knows i cannot uh, write neatly uh, m plus little m over the b squared v squared. So what we did so far is we figured out, okay, how much kinetic energy is now because these objects are moving towards uh, the sort of midline. The big object gets pulled up, not by much, its velocity doesn't change much, uh, and then the little object gets pulled down, big uh, velocity uh, sort of pulled down. So uh, we get that as the kinetic energy in the perpendicular uh, motion, but Energy is conserved and it's a scalar, so there must also be a sort of change in kinetic energy in the forward motion of the object. And so what we do is we sort of say, well, in this case, uh, the kinetic energy before and after the passage kind of has the same form. We're going to say, okay, well, we know this is the change in motion in the perpendicular direction. So if we just consider sort of the forward motion uh, or for the whole system, uh, the kinetic energy before and the kinetic energy afterward have to be equal. Uh, before, that's the easy side, one half m uh, v squared. And then there's going to be, we know that some of the motion went into the um, uh, perpendicular motion. We calculated it over here. I'm going to call that delta K. Uh, let me draw a boundary in here. That's this thing over here is delta K. Uh, and so from there, what we'll do is we'll say, okay, and then the other two uh, particles must have a change in their uh, 
the rest of their velocity with a magnitude one half. Oh, sorry, I'm still in red. Uh, ah, let's just roll with it. One half m. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to define a small perturbation to the velocity. Uh, so I'm going to call it v plus delta v, and our conjecture is delta v will be less than zero because uh, if we are pulling uh, objects, uh, they're probably going to have their overall velocities uh, shrink a little. And then, uh, or sorry, if we're giving kinetic energy for motions in one mode, uh, it's probably going to come out of kinetic energy for motions in the other. Uh, and then the other, the little object, has kinetic energy one half little m, and if the big object is sort of slowed down by this little delta v, the little object is going to be sped up by a ratio. Again, this is kind of the equal impulse, big m over little m times delta v squared. And then I'm going to expand this. Uh, we'll go one half m of v squared is equal to the kinetic energy from the perpendicular motions plus the one half big m and here we go v plus 2v dv plus delta v squared plus one half uh we'll just call this m oh sorry we'll call this big m squared over little m delta v squared now we are going to engage in the classic lie or approximation of um, uh, the classic approximation of the uh, uh, perturbation theory, which is we're going to assume that terms with delta v squared are going to be much, much less than terms with delta v times v in magnitude and drop all delta v squared terms. So what that is going to do is it's going to get rid of all of the things with a delta v squared in them. And so that gets rid of this, gets rid of this second term back here, and we are left with something that we can solve for a delta v. So what we're going to do is we're going to solve for that. So with that, uh, back to the math. So we go one half big M, big V squared is the delta K we calculated up top, uh, plus a one half M V squared, plus uh, M times V times a DV. That's uh, that one right there. And then we can solve, oh, <laughs> goodbye. And we'll solve for that delta V. And we will find that it has uh, delta K uh, over, mv is equal to the delta v. Oh, there's a negative sign on it. That, as I said, made sense. Should be less than zero. So, cool. Um, we've got an expression for delta k, and then we have an expression for how much the big object slows down. Uh, okay, well, uh, that's that's good. And so let me just recall that what we got here was essentially a uh, change in velocity, change in velocity for a single interaction with impact parameter, with impact parameter B. All right, so what we have is the change in velocity from a single encounter. Now what we want to do is figure out the change in velocity for lots of encounters. And so what we're going to do is we're going to essentially say each one of those contributes a little delta v uh, of this form right here. And then what we're going to do is we're going to figure out what the total delta v is. So we can just write down, okay, uh, the total delta v is going to be the number of encounters 
times uh, the magnitude for each encounter, which as you will call is a function of the impact parameter B. So we're going to figure out all the encounters it can have with that impact parameter. And this sets up a very familiar physics scenario. Uh, so specifically what we have is we are going to set up this cylinder. Uh, we're going to imagine our big massive object here, big M, is trucking along with speed V. It comes into a cylinder here. All right. That cylinder is going to have radius B, and it's going to have thickness DB. So there's a DB, and then this is the B. And then it's going to move along there at a speed V. So it has a, a speed V for a unit of time that I'll call delta t. Uh, and within uh, this cylinder, there are going to be a number of encounters uh, that are proportional to the number density of the objects times the volume of the cylinder. So the number of encounters is going to be the little n number density of the tiny objects times the volume of the cylinder, which is uh, 2 pi b db uh, sorry, db times v times delta t. That's the number of encounters, each of which contributes a delta v. So the total change in velocity is the sum of all of those encounters and then all of the impact parameters, so all of the values b. And we're going to calculate this with the integral from b min to b max of all the possible encounters, which is n times 2 pi b db uh, times v times delta t times the change for each at a given impact parameter, which we are going to write down as 2g little m times m plus m over uh, b squared v cubed. So that was from the previous slide over here. It's basically this divided by big M v. Um, and that gives us that delta V. Oh, and the ever important negative sign. So given that, uh, we can pull out, do some canceling. Aha, cancel like the wind, cancel, 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 makes that into a square. And then we're going to pull out everything except for the constant, uh, except for the B, uh, as everything else is constant under the integral sign. Uh, so we pull that out and we get minus two pi times N times uh, delta v times, uh, oh, there's a 2g little m big M plus m. Uh, I'm going to plot a v squared ooh, over v squared. And then we have left inside integral b min to a b max times db over b. Ooh. That's a familiar bit of math. That's exactly the same bit of math we had in the collision problem again. And so we are going to write that as we did before as log lambda, big lambda, where big lambda is the ratio of the maximum scale in the system to the minimum scale in the system. And since it's a log, it doesn't really matter how precisely uh, those are. It's just a small change. Uh, so from there, we're going to do a couple more uh, bits of math. We're going to write down that the little m times n, we're going to write that as a mass density rho. And that's the mass per particle times the number density particles, mass density. The other thing we'll do is we're going to say that I said that the little m's were little, so I'm going to approximate the sum m plus m as big M alone. And if I do that, I end up with minus 4 pi g squared rho times um, big M over v squared times log lambda. And this, oh, and I have dropped a delta t. I'm a horrible human being. Let me write that down. Delta t, whoop, delta t and a delta t. I'm going to divide that under this side, and then it becomes a delta v delta t. That's an acceleration. So we're going to write that as delta v over delta t is the exact same math with the delta v that I forgot. 
see, it was easy to forget because I knew that that delta t shouldn't be there in the long run. Uh, v squared times uh, log lambda. So this is an acceleration or a deceleration. And we call it a friction because it slows down uh, the galaxy as it moves through a field of stuff. That stuff can be other stars, it can be dark matter, it can be all kinds of stuff gets pulled towards the galaxy. I want to call your attention to the general shape of this expression where it depends uh, the bigger objects, big M, get decelerated more. It's kind of a weird phenomenon, but it's because they create a bigger influence on uh, the stuff around them and rearrange it more so there's more of a pullback. So it's weird that you get something where the acceleration of larger objects is larger. So that's kind of weird. Uh, the other thing is it depends uh, inversely on how fast uh, it's going. So faster objects suffer less uh, deceleration. And then it depends on the mass density of the field, kind of as you expect. But overall, it's this linear scaling with mass that's hyper weird. Um, so that means that the, the sort of if there was a dynamical friction force, it would go like m squared. Right, so m something like m, you end up with this proportional to mass in the acceleration. So it's a little bit uh, kind of a strange force, uh, but you know it slows stuff down and it slows big stuff down more. And so this is the thing that actually facilitates galaxy collisions. So uh, I want to talk a little bit about galaxy in clusters and environments. First, and then we'll uh, sort of sum up uh, galaxy collisions because uh, this dynamical friction force enables uh, galaxies to collide, uh, but they're doing so often in a cluster or a group environment, which is also causing trouble. Uh, we see because of collisions and active galactic nuclei and starburst and feedback that a lot of material uh, in uh, these galaxy clusters is found in the form of hot plasma. And in fact, this is the dominant mass form in a galaxy cluster. There's more mass in the hot plasma of million Kelvin X-ray emitting gas than there is in the stars uh, in galaxy clusters. And so uh, these systems, uh, you can see this is the X-ray image, and then this is an optical image of the same cluster. So most of the gas is hanging out in, or most of the mass is hanging out over here in this X-ray emitting gas. And so this fills the environment with a lot of uh, hot gas, and if it's filled with hot gas, if you have a system falling into this cluster, getting ready to do some collisions, one of the first things it does is it can strip off the gas as it rains in. And so this is a galaxy that is heading off in uh, this direction. So it's moving, uh, that's hard to see. Let's go ahead and make this a little more visible. So it's moving off in this direction towards the upper left in this picture and then this stuff back here behind it is the gas that's being stripped off of it as it basically faces a headwind of this high uh, temperature plasma uh, so as it's sort of falling in and crashing through it this is essentially the atmosphere that it's running through and that gas blows a wind through the galaxy, sweeps out all the other gas. The stars don't care. And so the stars very happily here just keep going into the center of the galaxy because they don't get affected by the wind. But the gas itself gets blown away. And it often triggers star formation, which is why you see these blue streamers behind it. These are often called jellyfish galaxies because you have a body of a jellyfish. And then the tentacles here coming off the back in... Um, the in in the form of uh star formation okay we get uh plenty of collisions in groups and clusters abetted by the um dynamical friction force that we just saw and so uh in fact enabled by uh that and we generally i just want to note that we see two types of collisions that depend on whether we have lost a bunch of gas out of the galaxies first or whether they are colliding full of gas if they collide full of gas we get a scenario that's called a wet collision because the fluids splash into each other. And when the fluids splash into each other, they can trigger a burst of star formation. And so that's what's happening over here in the antenna galaxy. These are two galaxies. Here's one, here's the other. You can sort of see the spiral arms in that one. 
and then the spire water is in this one here. They're colliding into each other, and then there's this gas here that is being smooshed together and is forming a huge burst of ongoing star formation. But that triggers feedback, it blows out all the gas, it heats everything up. The other thing that we tend to see is dry collisions. And so this is an example of, oh, I forget what, NGC 447, I think. Um, it is the subject of a dry collision. And if you don't have a um, the gas to sort of trigger these star formation and reorganize uh, where the mass is in the galaxy, stars just pass through each other when they collide. They, they don't have time to relax. If it's just star systems, so what can happen if you strip out all of the gas through ram pressure before it collides, you end up with a dry collision. And if you do that, you're just subject to stellar dynamical effects. And you're left behind with these interesting sort of shell structures that are the remnants of previous collisions. These are all the previous orbits of the stars that are embedded in the system. You can see these arcs here. That's stuff that has sort of fallen in and been sort of stretched out by tides. But the orbits keep the stars there and they keep tracing out their relic orbits and it will take a full relaxation time before all this structure here goes away. So galaxies, even though they can look spheroidal, are not relaxed systems just because the relaxation times are so long. And so a system like this still has the relics of all of its original motion, uh, all of its original motion and assembly history here in it. So this shows up in the dry collisions. Uh, in wet collisions, they tend to form into a bunch of random orbits and just stay that way. So it looks much more like a relaxed system or is much closer to the state of being a relaxed system. All right, that was a lot, but we have gone through a ton about galaxy populations. Uh, so I hope uh, it was interesting to you, and we will see you on the homework side.